Hello and welcome to the Dynamic Leaders Podcast, part of the Talent 409 Leadership Academy Network. I am your host, Colin Cernelia, and thank you so much for joining us today. Please head over to talent409.com to learn more about how we can help your team or organization with their leadership and culture development. This podcast is available on Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast. Plus, don't forget, you can now play this podcast on any Amazon-enabled device. Just ask Alexa, play the Dynamic Leaders podcast. Getting Dynamic Leaders with Colin Treniglia from Apple Podcasts. Before this episode begins, please consider taking a minute and leave a rating and review. Doing this really does help us grow the show, and you can get featured for your review on a future episode. All right, everyone, welcome to episode 112 of the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. Today, my featured guest is Rachel Breton. Rachel was a professional soccer player with Sky Blue FC. She now does many different things, calls herself a jack of all trades, everything from videographer, photographer, media marketing director, sports psych guru, trainer and coach. If you need something done, Rachel can probably do it for you. This is a really fun conversation. Rachel has a lot of energy. She talks a lot about Kobe Bryant. She talks about her sabbatical from soccer, as she puts it. There's a ton of laughs because she is so funny, and I think you will certainly learn a lot from her, her creativity, her energy, her stories of overcoming adversity and growth. So let's dive right into it, and let's discover our talent altitude. Here is my talk with Rachel Breton. podcast today my guest with me is rachel breton rachel thank you so much for joining the show no problem really happy to be here awesome i'm so happy that you're here i'm happy you're here and with that i want to give you an opportunity to tell the listening audience a little bit about yourself so can you please tell us who are you oh of course with so much importance i am (laughs) (laughs) hi guys i'm rachel breton i am a former professional soccer player uh, currently, I am pursuing a different kind of career. Tough struggle, but um, right now I'm doing a couple of things, a multitude of things. I am a soccer coach and trainer, uh, director of social media marketing for a couple of companies, a content creator, and freelance videographer and writer. I always like to give the context into that. Who are we talking to? Why are we talking to this person on the podcast today? And Like with most of my guests, you have an athletic background and mentioned playing professional soccer. And I imagine there were a lot of other sports that were involved in your life growing up. But can we talk first about sports and just talk about what that whole realm of competition and team aspect and everything that you get from athletics? What have you learned from that over the course of your lifetime? That's a great question. I don't think this is biased. I think that sports save lives. You know, I think they build character. I think they teach you a lot. For me, uh, my dad played professional soccer. My mom was a runner. They did a great job with not pushing anything. It was just I saw that my parents could do certain things, and they were my role models. I wanted to be like them too, you know, very intelligent, very athletic individuals. And, you know, you mentioned that I did other sports stuff. Only other thing that I did was track to keep in shape for soccer. For me, soccer was my first love and my <laughs> my greatest love, I think. Sorry for everyone I've ever dated. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, you know, I think in the life of soccer, it taught me love. It taught me hate. It taught me betrayal. It taught me team. It taught me adversity. It taught me growth. You know, just things that – that you truly will not understand as deeply as an athlete would. Um, And, you know, I'm forever indebted to it, you know, and that's why I'm trying to give back to those individuals that don't get that or haven't seen how important a sport could be. 
I think that <laughs> sports saves lives is one of the greatest phrases I've ever heard. <laughs> I'll start with that. But the reason I say that is because I feel so strongly about the power. And I don't I don't know. Is power the right word? Probably a better word. But let's go with power for now because that's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. The way that sports can connect a community, for example, yeah. whether whether it's because of devastation or it's because of a long drought or it's just because of pure joy for the team that is in a particular city or town. And I think it's so cool when people poo poo on sports and they're like, why is this so important? Why do people care so much? And then you see millions of people in a ticker tape parade at the end of a season supporting a team. And it's this big community event. And I love that you said sports saves lives because it reminds me of that, but I'm sure it means different things to different people and can run a little bit deeper than that too. And I'd love to just dive a little bit deeper into that phrase with you and understand a little bit more about why you feel that way about it. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, everyone's, uh, everyone really does hate on people that are like fans of certain things, but <laughs> name something else that really brings a community together, mm -hmm. you know, whether it be sad or, or happy. I mean, prime example and, you know, rests in peace like Kobe Bryant mm -hmm. um I mean name another person and I'm sure there might be others but like this is the most recent name someone else that's touched so many lives that I think only maybe 0.5 percent no point yeah like one percent has he's met you know I've never met Kobe but I cried when he died because like what he did to to my life as an, as a you know sports fanatic or as an athlete, you know, like I do a lot of sports psychology, um, Ted talks and I bring him up all the time because he talks about how it's important to be a human first and to separate athlete versus human, you know, like he touched so many lives and brought communities together. You know, the fact that people still mourn his death and they feel so impacted, that's astronomical. Like that, that just kind of goes to show you that one, how much a person could really contribute and two, what do you do with your podium? What do you do with your pedestal as an athlete? What are you telling others? What are you teaching others? How are you bringing them to come to realize personal value and purpose? As an athlete, I'm really curious to get your opinion on this. I'd have to imagine there are folks out there because there were athletes in the past that wanted no part of being anything other than a ball player or being known for anything other than a ball player. Like if that makes sense, like they didn't want to dive into politics. They didn't want to dive into how to make the community better or what their personal opinion was on X, Y, Z topic. They just wanted to go out and play the game. They didn't really understand sometimes why there was this bigger emphasis placed on their opinions versus like someone who is a professional in a certain field, for example, but because they're athletes, they're put into the public view. And I think more and more, especially with generations that are growing up with social media and the connectivity that all of the internet has provided, athletes are seeing their voice as a way to be that platform and as a way to be influential. What I'm wondering is how do you, determine how much you want to use a platform like while you're in competition and your primary job right is to win soccer games for example like to be available for your team to be healthy travel do all these things that are involved but maybe there's an opportunity for you to impact the next generation you can speak at a school you can do a fundraiser or something like that how do we do a little bit of everything while also being able to focus on our primary responsibilities? That's a great question and a great topic that I could probably go on and off of. <laughs> um, basically, I think is at the end of the day, we have to keep reevaluating our purpose. What's the, the purpose path? I think in turn, that means like, what is your vocation? And it's important to separate sport, like sport, Rachel, like professional soccer, Rachel, separate her than, you know, human Rachel, because it like goes back to, you know, you know, Kobe, he talks about, you know, he had to be black Mamba, 
He had mm-hmm. to be something different to, for him to drive to be this competitor. Uh, and essentially that's who he is, but that's not all of him. And, and the same thing for me, like I am, I'm Rachel on the field, but then off the field, I'm this, you know, philosophical, deep, funny, you know, like just like a, a plethora of just different things that necessarily aren't me on the field. So I think number one is your vocation. The other two is your purpose, which they're not interchangeable. They're different because I feel if you have a vocation, then you can have a purpose. And why I bring this up is that then you could start to tell your story because everyone has a story. So you use your platform to tell a story. And, you know, some people have different paths. They have different voices. They're more passionate about certain things. You know, I commend, you know, people give Meg Rapino a lot of, you know, backlash because she's all about women's rights and creating equality. I have no opinion of it. I think it's commendable because it's showing leadership. It's showing that this is something that she's passionate about. She's willing to take the positive uh, remarks and the negative remarks. And when you go so into something, you have to be aware of that. And that, uh, that's the same thing with uh, politics. You know that if you pick a side, whatever it is, pro-choice or not pro-choice, you're going to have backlash. So it goes with understanding that and then going back to, What's your vocation? What's your purpose? And how are you going to execute it? Some people, like some athletes, they just want to be athletes. And I, and I do get that um, because they could be, and this is what I've learned too, is that some athletes just want to get on the field, get it done. They do everything right. They show up with the right gear. They carry the ball bags. They are just unsung heroes. And they just want to have their introverted life because they're introverted. They might also not understand that their voice matters. So I understand that I can't relate because I'm a pretty enthusiastic person, Mm -hmm. but I also like for me, I'm a pretty great person. So I play devil's advocate all day. I can't be like all pro something or all against something like, you know, I'm a Christian, but I read about Buddhism and atheism and, you know, Taoism, like that. I just think it's important to be all, all knowing so you could be uh, uh, objective. I think that, Interestingly enough, I, I watched the Netflix, <laughs> and embarrassingly enough, I watched uh, <laughs> Taylor Swift's um, Netflix documentary, and she was talking about how, you know, she was living this life um, kind of like a fraud. You know, she was getting backlash. She wanted to talk about why Tennessee was, uh, it was important for politics for her to, like, make her voice known because she doesn't agree with something, and she knows that with her opinion could help and save lives. And that was, you know, paramount for her. But it helped to, un- like, it helped me to understand that, again, what are you using your, whatever, fame, quote unquote, athleticism? What will you use it for? Will you use it for good or will you use it for harm? And can you stick to that? I'd like to ask a follow up question. Do you think that in our society today, that it's almost imperative that athletes, like, I don't know that athletes have a choice anymore whether or not they just want to be an athlete and be behind the scenes. Like if you're a star athlete, it's almost like being the president. I feel like, like you can't just be good at politics. You have to be the CEO. Like you have to be able to have conversations with everybody and go to all these events and everything. Like you can't just sit behind your desk and push politics all day long. Like, is it, are we at that point in our society now where as an athlete, you can't just be on the soccer field and be this amazing soccer player and not contribute something else? I don't think so. I don't think it's imperative. I just think like, again, it's, it's, it's what's your, what are you passionate about? Like if you, if let's say that you have, like I have a friend who uh, plays professional soccer and he had really bad eczema and he decided to go plant-based and it reduced the inflammation in his body and it, and it cured his eczema and his skin is cleared so much. I thought that was great because now he's talking about being plant-based and it's not the wave of like, Oh, you got to go plant-based. Like, <laughs> you got to do this. It's got to go vegan. Like, it's not like, it's not the, like, it's not more of a trend. It's more of a purpose, right? He's mm-hmm. saying for those that have suffered from inflammation of skin or eczema, try this. This is, this has worked for me. And I don't think I could ever go back because now I feel better. I'm, I'm playing better performance based and my skin is better. You know, I was embarrassed. I felt insecure, all these things. And I think that's a great platform, but if you don't, you don't feel passionate about that, you don't have to join the train to do it. You know, like I think a lot of 
athletes, and I blame social media for this. I think social media could be a great tool, but I also think it could be a burden. I think it could be um, the reason and the increase of why anxiety and depression and suicides have increased so much because people are using it to like, oh, well, they have a sponsorship, so I should have a sponsorship, and I have to be an advocate for this, or I have to do this, and it's, no, you don't necessarily have to do it if you're not passionate about it, you know? If you just want to sit out and ball and kind of be gray because you're not sure, I think that that's the best thing because that's how you feel. If you're not sure or certain, stay. But if you feel like in in your like in your loins that you have to speak out about something because you've been a victim of or you see or you see someone very close to you that has suffered and you think that you could make a change, then yeah, I think that that that, that would be more imperative. If you feel it, then do it. Very powerful conversation. I'm sure, like you said, we could spend a lot more time on that topic, but we're going to <laughs> plow ahead here and try to get through a few other topics. So I want to go back to soccer, actually. And you mentioned how it was your first love and still probably the most powerful love that you've experienced to this day. I'm curious as to how that was developed. I mean, there were so many things you mentioned being taught love, being taught hate, teamwork, growth, so many great lessons about competition, but also just about life that you can learn from one sport. So I'd love to learn from you where that came from. Like, was it just the process of playing? Was it the experiences? Was it some of the people that surrounded you? How did you get this great view and this great experience of soccer? I think like, and again, it's not, it's not been, uh, butterflies and rainbows um it's but playing a sport is tough because one if you're a true competitor then that's you know one-on-one you're a competitor so for me nothing and you know my friends yank on me about this like like, nothing's good enough you know Uh, I could always have done better that could have been a better pass that could have been I could have seen that other option I should have shot oh I should like instead of passing like I should have done this Oh, what about this combination? And that's just me as a human being, you know, and I have a friend, we, we're accountability partners now. And I'm like, Hey, you got to remember it's fun, but that's me now kind of being a little bit out of the game as well, as much as I can be. But that's just, again, so that's a, that's me as a person and, and a lot of athletes, it's tough. You know, the reason that I, I think that well, the reason again, why I started with my father, I, I watched him play. And he was just doing the cool stuff. Like he was just doing things that were so creative. And, and at the time uh, I'm, I'm 29 now and people are like, Oh, you're not that old, which is true. But like <laughs> at the time there wasn't a lot of like advertisement. There wasn't a lot of um, commercial. You can't like just go on ESPN plus and put in any, sh- any, you know, game. There wasn't a lot of replays. You know, you would have to really either go live or really be like, know what time the game was and watch and there wasn't women's professional soccer being broadcasted either. You know, that was the WPS. And yeah, I'll just be honest. It wasn't like really like what I got excited for. I really got excited for men's soccer because I played more like a dude. <laughs> but watching my dad being so creative and doing things that weren't so like robotic, it, it was like, wow. Like it just like really hit my my endorphins and my my dopamine would go high. So I was like, wow, I really want to learn like, that so my dad would teach me all right you gotta master the basics that's cool you want to do this flick and stuff and this rainbow and all these these cool things do that as an additional but you should be hitting passes 10 out of 10 if you're doing so much if you're doing something so much that it's impossible for you to make a mistake then you've mastered it and now you're an expert then you can move forward but you shouldn't be like oh you know i scored like two goals out of five like i'm pretty good let me move on to the next thing and with that mentality that's helped me understand everything in life that okay cool like just because like i play a couple instruments just because i can play a couple songs on the guitar doesn't make me really good at guitar like, <laughs> until until i can string always and not make mistakes and understand the chords and read the music then we can move forward to something else you know the same thing with soccer you know i was just like i was so hungry i wanted to get better and better every time and yeah like i was i was a kid too like you know i tell my kids that I coach and train. I'm like, you got to go out there and just juggle. You got to go out there and 
and, you know, work on your craft. You know, there's 168 hours a week. You know, what are you doing with them? And that means, like, if you do 10 minutes a day, just put your headphones on, get your beat headphones, get lost. Just 10 minutes a day, you're already hitting 70 minutes, you know, and then you multiply that by four. You know, you got 280. That's a lot, you know, that you're really dedicating to your craft. That's my mentality now. But when I was a kid, I was like, nah. But then when I started to make it to, you know, state team, regional team, national team, you realize that you're amongst other quote unquote alphas, people that can do what you do. So how do you differentiate yourself besides passion? You know, and that meant that I had to put in more hard work. And I was fortunate enough to not get so like, I don't know, not to let pressure hit me because I really just didn't even know what was going on. Like, (laughs) and I feel bad for the kids now because it's like so many acronyms, so many things of exposure. Oh, if I don't have a TikTok, I'm not fun. I'm not popular. Oh my gosh. Like there's this Instagram. I need to like get this amount of jungles. There's so much exposure that it's like hindering kids growth. And when I was getting, when I was growing up, I had a team that we were all like-minded. We all wanted to play D1. We all got along. They're like still my best friends. I've gone to all of their weddings (laughs) and uh, like, like that, like that bond helped. We had a coach just genuinely gave his all to us and just created us to be these like creatively, beautifully minded individuals. And it helped us grow in the game. Again, I just was like, just focus on just, wow, I just got lost. Like every, I would, I would crave practice. I'd be at school and I was an academic, but even in between, like, I'd be like, oh my gosh, we cannot wait for 7.30. We're going to kill it. And we would play until the lights, they like, had to kick us off the field every Tuesday, Thursday, Friday every tournament, like I just got lost and it was so much fun. And I think with that love and passion and support that that was the reason why I was able to play in college and play professionally and internationally, you know, it's and probably why it's so hard for me to let go, you know, because now I'm in that transition of no longer playing or sure. I like to call sabbatical. I don't like to say <laughs> retired. <laughs> I just say I'm on a sabbatical. It makes it feel better. Um, but without that, without that love and fun, I don't know why anyone could play a sport. Yeah. And it's really interesting. I totally understand. I'll start with that because I went through the same thing and I'll be honest, I don't even know. I'm 31 and I've been out of baseball longer than you've, you're on your soccer sabbatical now. I don't know that I've ever found anything that has replaced it. And I don't know if I ever will, honestly, like the everyday fulfillment outside of maybe my marriage with my wife, which is, I think just totally different, but anyway, (laughs) yeah. I I get it. Yeah. So you're obviously just starting this process now of transitioning out. And I'm just wondering now that you know what some of the key pieces were that, turned into the fulfillment part of soccer, right? Like the fulfillment, the joy, the drive and the energy that you got from playing the sport. Do you have like some type of idea as to where you think you can channel all of that into something else in a life after sport? Like, have you given any thought to that? Has like any direction popped up that said, Hey, this looks like it might be a good opportunity. Yeah. (laughs) It's so funny that you're uh, bringing that up because this has been my, (laughs) this has been my 2020 dilemma. (laughs) Uh, And it's like, it's not embarrassing, but it's kind of like, it's just tough, you know, like my friends all have whatever their opinions are. And, you know, I have like other, I have other uh, teammates or or whatever, former teammates or players that I've played against that kind of have, you know, a direction and they move forward. And for me, like, it's tough for me because I am a jack of all trades. And this is not like to be a braggart, like I'm not trying to be braggadocious. Like I'm just like basically just saying that you throw something at me, I will learn how to do it. There's been, I've gotten so many opportunities, but just saying yes, because it's like, yeah, you know, I don't know. I read this or I heard this a long time ago, I think as a kid, and it could totally be misquoted, but it stuck with me. (laughs) But it was something about like, Abraham Lincoln saying like, 
You go, what you got to do is that when an opportunity comes, you just say yes, and then you figure out how to do that yes. And I don't know if that's even correct, but I remember that. And I was like, okay, yeah. And that's co- become a lot of my livelihood and just living. And I and that has led me to, you know, after uh, my first year of not playing, I was um, a writer for Excel Sports, and I had my own column about life after sport. And my vision with it was to interview any kind of athlete that ha- had to tragically just stop because of a car accident or, you know, an Olympian that has reached everything she's ever wanted at, by the age of 32. Now what? To the person that feels great. They've, they've, done, they've done wonders. They're good. They're married. They're working for Adidas. You know, like I just think everyone has a story. So, you know, I've used that as a tool to express and something that I could do. Videography has been something that I've been passionate about and I've done a lot of my former players' weddings. Um, and I like to use it to tell stories on a fitness level, uh, on a growth level. The thing that, I got, that I'm stuck with is coaching. And I think that's what kind of frustrates me because that's the next question that I get. Oh, you're done playing. So, like, I bet you're coaching now. And I find it kind of offensive because I'm like, not, I'm not saying that you, that coaches are dumb, but I'm saying that I'm smarter than that. Like I'm smarter than just to like go to like a plan F. Well, yeah, well, I guess I'll just coach. Like, no, like I, I got a, I had a high GPA at Rutgers, you know, I'm a double major in psych and English. Like I want to utilize those tools and not just go by like a going through the motions kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how I feel right now. I feel that. I am like kind of stuck because I want to go in a direction where I could hit these tools. I want to be motivational. I want to be a leader. I want to tell stories. I want to hit the psyche of, you know, an athlete's brain and help youth and current players and anybody kind of where it's, it's your mindset. Really. We say as an athlete, like it's 90% 90 of the game is your mind. But that's also life, you know, like life's going to throw you curveballs and you're going to get hit with adversity. Suffering is inevitable. How do you deal with it? Going back to Kobe, I think Kobe said something. I read something, uh, Cindy, Cindy LaRouge wrote something and she was talking about her transitions and he said, you got to figure it out. That was his response. <laughs> and I thought that was great because, you know, some might say that that's insensitive, but it's not true. Like, yeah, you're here. <laughs> what are you going to do? Like, You got everyone quotes about this one life. What are you going to do with this one life? And that's what I'm dealing with right now. And I'm taking some time because I'm not an irrational person. And I'm not just going to do sales because I would be really good at sales. Like, that's great. (laughs) I think if you put your mind to anything, you'll be great at it. But I really want to do something where I genuinely can just make a difference. And maybe you could, maybe, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think that the first point I want to highlight is the simplicity aspect. And you use Kobe's quote, and I think that's great because I think we do spend a lot of time as a society overanalyzing pretty much everything. And I'm sure my podcast here is part of the problem in some ways and not the solution. It's just like another avenue for people to explore whatever challenges that they're having and try to find answers when sometimes the best answer is to just do it and not overthink it. Like just do what feels right, see what happens and then reevaluate and maybe go to some other resource. But so I think that's a really important point to it all. And I think that one of the bigger themes that stood out from you talking about all of that was the fact that you're open to a lot of different ideas and a lot of different opportunities. And this doesn't seem like it's something new. You mentioned having different likes and opinions and and things throughout the entirety of your life and studying different concepts in school. And I think more people, if they were just open to different things versus being so one-sided and so sheltered from (laughs) different opinions. And I know that kind of sounds counterintuitive to what I just said, just do it and not (laughs) think of, uh, but (laughs) right, right. And I'd love to hear a little bit about where that openness mindset comes from you. Cause really it's a mindset and you talked about how important that mindset is. And I think it's something that you can, if you don't have it, 
right now is something you can certainly learn. So I'd love if there's somebody who's listening to this and they're saying, oh, wow, I maybe am a little too one-sided with my thoughts and my opinions and I should branch out a little bit. How do I become more open-minded as a person? I think that people people um, are too dogmatic <laughs> at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think people rely on I guess word of mouth versus doing their own research, you know, and that comes with, uh, and again, like I love psychology. It comes with, you know, environment, nature and nurture. It, you know, if it's part of your nature to be a certain way and you're being nurtured that certain way, it's really tough for you to break that uh, habitually. If you are being brought up to, it only has to be this. This is the only way you wash dishes. This is the only <laughs> way of like things that like, it's just like, I just, I just want everyone to take a step back and just really evaluate. You really think there's only one way? If you really think there's <laughs> only one way, then why aren't we all doing it? <laughs> and then the other part of it is then, then if there was only one way, we wouldn't even be, I would not be able to be having this conversation with you because this would not have been created. You mm-hmm. know, like you think about people that are discovering ways to even cure this coronavirus. People are trying different methods to figure out a solution and i think that you have to be open-minded you have to be open-minded in every regard in every situation because you know it doesn't mean that you have to sell your soul and we can get caught with that you know don't gain the world and lose your soul totally but in this regard it's more of like you can have your opinion but hear out the other opinion and you can still stick with your opinion you could also use it to strengthen how you feel or for you to be like, you know what, I can see how you feel. I, I don't agree with it, you know, but it's an interesting argument. That's super, that's, I think that's just, that kind of makes you, I think just emotionally intelligent because again, there's not just one way to open a door, you know? <laughs> I mean, you can use the knob or you can kick it through. They're going to get through the door, you know? Right. And one's more creative, the other one's not, you know? But if you're going to figure out a way, you got to figure out a way. And I think, um, for me, again, I think both of my parents and everyone in my family has been very, we just go back and forth with a couple of things. And maybe because I'm this way is why I'm like, oh, no, there's like, there's no definite. But there's no definite in life. You know, we're forgetting the the order of chaos. We're forgetting that there could be higher being. We're forgetting that, you know, we do have free will. We're forgetting that there's a lot of, a lot of factors. It's like, it's like fractals. There's so many algorithms to either lead to the same solution or to a different solution but there are just so many ways that it's important to stay open because i think if you resist i think i read this in the power of the now when you resist something you actually feel it tenfold so if you're resisting feeling pain you're going to feel more pain if you just let loose a little bit and let go you'll feel you'll feel the pain but it'll alleviate into something else and you could turn it for good you can't just look at like Every bad thing that happens to you is horrible. Why? What was you? No, like maybe the bad thing that happened to you is because of something that might that you missed, or to help you, help you grow. Again, it's, it's a mindset, and and again, I'm not saying that I've been this my whole life. I've you know I've been heartbroken, and I'm like, oh, this is the worst, or I've been disappointed, but I've chosen to use it for good because it helps you just do better and it's inspiring to those to join you. Hey everyone, Christine here from Sweat with Stods, one of this show's sponsors. The Dynamic Leaders Podcast is here to help you be a better leader and the best leaders take care of themselves both mentally and physically. I'm here to help on the physical side by making fitness accessible to everyone. As a certified personal trainer with years of experience coaching fitness classes, I've designed programs that can be followed at home and in the gym. These are intelligently structured programs, giving you a plan to follow to help you be successful. Build strength with my Get Strong at Home program, get quick results with Hit at Home 1 or 2, or work on your health outside of fitness with my Healthy Habits program. As a listener, you can get these programs at a discounted rate by entering code DYNAMIC at checkout. That's D-Y-N-A-M-I-C at checkout. So head on over to sweatwithstods.com, that's sweat with S-T-O-D-D-S dot com, to take the next step toward achieving your health and fitness goals today. You are 
in the midst of the sabbatical, as you put it right now, but yeah. this isn't your first experience with some type of significant change. I read that you actually started school at Villanova University before, as you mentioned earlier, finishing up at Rutgers. So there are tons of people, whether they are student athletes or the general student population that often wonder whether or not they picked the right school when they are on campus for maybe that freshman year. And some of us transfer, some of us stick it out. And for you, it seemed like the answer for one reason or another was transfer. And I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about what went into that process. Like, why did you consider transferring and why did you ultimately transfer? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I just kind of, this is obviously for everyone to hear. I kind of did it all wrong. I didn't really have, uh, that's why I'm really um, passionate about helping kids quote unquote, pick the right school or just do their homework. I was fortunate enough to get a lot of full ride offers and a lot of schools to look at me. And some people are like, that's amazing. And I think that maybe, but I also think that it was <laughs> overwhelming. And I'm, this is all in hindsight because, you know, I felt like I was like speed dating. I'm like talking to West Virginia, then I'm talking to Stanford, then I'm talking to Nova, I'm talking to UPenn, I'm talking to Cornell, I'm talking to Princeton. Then I'm like, hey, why don't I like look at the Big Ten? Why don't I look at the, you know, the Big East? Why don't I look at the ACC? Like there was just so much and I didn't even know what I was looking at. Like I just wanted to find a coach that seemed cool and a reputable school where they were great athletically that could set me up if I wanted to play pro or if I wanted to have like I wanted to have a, set, a successful career in soccer but I also didn't want to like just throw that all all my academic performance away because at the end of the day I always knew that this would end and what are you to do with the 70 years of your life hoping that you reach 100 you have to care about academics and my parents were academics too. Like my dad went to Syracuse. My mom went to Harvard and Rutgers and NYU Law. Like it was always in the family. Um, so I didn't want to throw that away. So with all that being said, I just really didn't know what to look for. Like I, I would go to all these officials or unofficials and the, co the college coaches and student athletes would show me around. And I'm like, this is cool. But like, I didn't know what I was looking at. Like, cool. This is a weight room. Yeah, cool, sick. Like I now I have a huge uh, appreciation for it because I didn't know that I was going to basically sleep there. You know, like we're there all the time and I didn't know like how important it was to see your stadium. Like I was like cool, like this is a grass field. Sick. When do I sign up? You know, I didn't know that it, it mattered about how many people you could bring to your game or that the football was big there and they could help you. They could help your program or the alumni um, support group was important or you know that you had to care about what kind of field or kind of, I really didn't know because I was uh, I'm an only child and my parents you know this wasn't available two decades before so we were all just kind of trying to figure it out so I didn't really know how to narrow it down and I wanted my parents dedicated so much of their time uh, and effort and money to this dream, you know, for me to, to play soccer collegiately and to, you know, I don't know, just be great. And I wanted to reward them with being closer to home so they could, they could come to a game. Cause I know that they would want to see me play and they, I know that they would try to fly to wherever I was. And I didn't want that. I wanted them to be part of the experience. It was more of like, we did this together. So let's do this together. That I don't regret, but I think that I could have done my homework better. So I picked Nova because Ann Clifton was the coach at the time. They were top 10 in the nation at the time. And she gave me the best, one of the best tours I've ever had. She just really showed that she really wanted me. And I was like, all right, let's do it. I first verbally committed to Penn and, Again, I'm sorry, Darren Ambrose. I I reneged on my uh, verbal commitment, and uh, again, that just goes to show you that I just wasn't really sure. I was also like really, really, really looking at Princeton with uh, Julie Shackford, 
but I just didn't want to pay uh, the, the loans. And mm-hmm. if I was getting a full ride versus paying like 40K or, or more at the time of grants, like it just didn't make sense, I guess. So I was there for two years and soccer wise, it wasn't good because we had these two new coaches and it just, it, it, it wasn't to just respect everybody there. It wasn't good. Um, so I had to, I had to, for my sanity, uh, leave and try something new. And I went to Rutgers and, um, Glenn Crooks and Mike O'Neill helped me out a lot. They showed, they taught me a lot. I ended up not taking my fifth year and yeah, that's a, my advice is that for the, like for girls and guys that are trying to find their school, go to the school, figure out what resonates with you. Do you like the school without the athletics? Let's say you get injured. Do you like the team that you're going to be dealing with for four years? Focus on that sophomore class. And do you, do they have your subjects of uh, desire that you'd want to major in and set you up, you know? visit the school visit it millions of times and if and even if you're so certain and it's not for you it's okay to transfer it's all right you know i was scared to do it i almost didn't even and like i wasn't gonna play i was like you know what let me just focus on playing overseas and it's all right i'll just go to school whatever that didn't end up happening i ended up playing four years and uh we moved forward well, thank you for sharing that. I think it's all really helpful advice, especially these days when I don't want to say it's encouraged, but it's much easier for student athletes in particular to transfer than at any point in our history before this. So I think there's right. a lot of folks out there, regardless of the sport they're playing, that are probably having these conversations in their head with their family members and try to determine. So I think that that information will certainly help them. And just hearing your story in general and knowing that you're not alone, right? Like you're not the only person who doesn't know if they made the right decision, whether it was an informed decision or not. So it's totally natural, totally cool. And I appreciate you sharing that. Rachel, I have two quick things here before I let you go today. The first is really an observation and I'd love to hear from you whether I'm on par with the course or not. But I was listening to you talk about watching your dad, for example, and learning about the game of soccer and the creativity aspect of playing soccer. And you don't really necessarily always hear that from athletes. You hear about like work ethic and the grind and fitness that goes into all of that. But it seems like you unlocked a side of you the creativity side of you from playing soccer is that somewhat accurate yes absolutely so i'd love to just know what goes into that creativity you talked about some of the ventures that you're doing now as you're transitioning and trying to figure out what direction you want to go into but where did that creativity take you throughout your life like can you just walk us down that path a little bit yeah you know i just think like the best way to describe it it's like uh, it's like when you're playing uh, Mario 64 and you find out there's uh, uh, 121 stars instead of 120. <laughs> <laughs> like you, you just uh, it kind of just opens so many other doors and avenues. And again, like coming full circle, it's about being open. So it's like, yeah, you know, I know how to do this cookie cutter thing, and I do think that there are certain ways to do something. Like I'm a person that likes to color in between the lines and do shades because I think it looks aesthetically better, but it doesn't mean that's the only way to color. You know, like you look at, you know, Van Gogh and how he, you know, did the starry night and, you know, but versus a pointillism, you know, with Edvard Munch, like these are, there are different ways to do certain things. And it's just kind of like taking everyone's opinions, including your own with a grain of salt, but understanding like, how do you express yourself? And for me, you know, I express myself truly with creativity. Like I like to see different ways that you can hit a ball or juggle or pick up the ball or have a pass hit up. Like they're just different. There's so many different angles and like different ways to just do something that why not try them all and add them to your, your portfolio. I always tell my student, well, students, athletes that I coach, watch the game and like, like pretend like you got a tool belt. You're just adding these tools 
to who you are and then adding a different flair to it. You know, a lot of if you listen to a lot of these documentaries of these athletes, they've been studying the game for years, like and meaning themselves, their own, the, watching themselves do film, watching, you know, decades upon decades of athletes creating things, adding it. You know, that's why I find it interesting why everyone has this comparison, like who's better, Mia Hamm or Abby Wambach or Michael Jordan or or LeBron. And it's like, these are just different decades. It's really impossible to compare and exposure, you know, but just take everything with a grain of salt and add to it your own individual flair. I've always been a creative kid. Like I'm into reading self-help and philosophy and psychology books, sociology. I'm into reading about spiritual spirituality and Christianity and whatever kind of religion I'm into playing us several instruments, creating different things, showing the vision of someone's eye and perspective. That's why I love videography and, and filmography. And that's what makes a song so great. And that's what makes a movie so great. And that's why if you pick the greatest soundtrack and the greatest movie and you put them together, that's why it can move people and change lives. And that's kind of always how I've been. And I think having parents to allow me to express that via sport the academics has, you know, definitely helped me grow and inspire others, hopefully. I think it has. It's inspired me. I know that at the very <laughs> least. So. But I think that it's so cool and it's unique in some ways to that from sport, you were able to develop this creative side. And I really appreciate you sharing that in all of the knowledge and the stories that you've shared today. And obviously everything's evolving and growing. And if our listeners want to follow along with you, how can we find you on social media, Rachel? At Rachel Brett, all across the border. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Simple enough. I'll put that in the show notes for people to reference. And Rachel, before I let you go, the show is called Dynamic Leaders. And I just outlined how you showcase your leadership and how you are dynamic and helping generations, next generation, get a little bit ahead of maybe where you were at one point or another. But I love for people to shout out my guests, to shout out somebody who's been influential in their own life. Do you have somebody that you'd like to give a quick shout out to today? I'd like to give a shout out to my one of my oldest best friends, George Coutinho. He has his own gym that he's handmade, grown, um, and with adversity, he continues to just get better, inspire athletes. He's done things that I have not seen people do, and um, right now he's going through a transition of finding another gym for him to do what he does. And I think that, you know, his emotional intelligence is high. He really cares about his clients and people. And he, in every situation, finds a way to uh, lead and motivate and inspire. Good job, George. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Such a great way to end this conversation. Rachel, thank you again so much for taking the time to hop on the show. I've really enjoyed this experience and looking forward to what the future holds for you. Thanks so much, Colin, and anything you need, you know what I'm on.